was like, life's about finding a cliff worth jumping off. I'm gonna look for something feral and wild. He was a traditional romantic. Reality was never gonna live up to exactly how he pictured it. Hey, what's up, man? He was always rushing to get into the scene. He was rushing to get out of the scene, to go somewhere next, even if he had nowhere to go. He was definitely searching for something. You were successful, and I am successful. And I'm wondering, are you happy? I know how hard it must have been for him to reach out to someone and be like, hey, man, I'm not doing well. Nothing feels better than going home. And nothing feels better than leaving home. The bittersweet curse. Travel isn't always pretty. You go away. You learn. You get scarred, marked, changed in the process. You inspire so many people with the show. You have a good karma. Good karma? I think so. Well... <laughs> <laughs>
uh, when he was doing No Reservations several years earlier, saying, you know, I think that you guys should come and do an episode in Iran. And we started uh, discussions about that. I think it was in 2007, 2008. Uh, and ultimately, it didn't go anywhere because uh, the Travel jam Channel just couldn't make it happen. When he moved over to CNN, um, they were able to do it. And literally a couple of days before, uh, um, before they came to shoot, Mail from one of the producers saying we're coming to Iran and we've been told that you're somebody that we should meet while we're there. Uh, and ultimately, we ended up shooting with them a scene in, in the last uh, day of their, their trip to Iran. Um, and it became a very faithful thing for us. A lot of people mm, wrongly believe that it had something to do with the arrest of my wife and me uh, and our imprisonment. It didn't. Uh, but but ultimately, it served as as really this this incredible testimonial um, of us that this beloved uh, television personality uh, would spend time with us and, and have such a, a warm and affectionate conversation with us as he did. Um, and then our friendship really grew out of that uh, when we returned to the States after uh, I was released from prison and, uh, and learned what a powerful and um, relentless advocate he was for, for my freedom. Uh, and then we had this opportunity to kind of uh, develop a friendship, uh, which was something that was incredibly meaningful to my wife and me. And and if I'm not mistaken, that you kind of had to convince. I mean, it it, it I think Tony felt a little bit um, ambivalent about the fact that maybe you did hold him responsible for your imprisonment. Was there a little was there a little bit of uh, tiptoeing there at the beginning? Well, so I think when when we first came back, he he wasn't sure, um, and you know I was very tenuous in terms of making contact with people after being in isolation for a year and a half, and I want to say it was maybe two or three weeks after I was released, um, I was back home in San Francisco and I was having my first burrito, uh, which was something that we talked about on the show, and I I you know I tweeted or Instagrammed a picture and tagged him in it. And immediately we started having a, a kind of a, a DM chat with each other. Um, and, you know, we ended up coming to New York and, and having dinner with him. And it was the first thing that I said to him, you know, it was really important to me to say, hey, look, this thing that happened to us had nothing to do with you. And I could just visibly see him relax and open up. And, um, and what transpired in all of our meetings after that, uh, usually over really great meals, uh, was a really beautiful and, and um, warm friendship. Mm. Morgan, yeah, in the let, yeah. let me just say something, be, uh, just because I know the episode in Iran with Jason was an episode that Tony talked about a lot. You know, I think for him it was, you know, one of the handful of most important episodes he ever did. And to me, it also symbolized Tony using the platform he had at its best, which is being able to humanize and dimensionalize people in countries that we only see on the evening news when bad things happen, as Tony says. So to me, that episode just showed, you know, you know, was the essence of what Tony did that, that really got me excited. And the more I thought about it, you know, Tony probably did more to show the world, starting with, you know, countries like Iran, but just literally to show the world to more of the world than anybody in television. I mean, I can't think of anybody else. And I thought about it. I mean, he really, it, it was a, you know, a, a righteous battle that he was engaged in to really be curious, to be empathetic, to not be judgmental. And, you know, those are the things that are in short supply these days. And uh, and it, I think it's one of the things we all miss about Tony as well. Indeed, um, you know, I, I think you just answered my question, which is at the beginning of the film, you say you wanted to, to find out who Anthony Bourdain was and not just uh, about to find out about how he died. And it, it to me, the, the message that comes through is that he was a, a great humanist. I mean, he was really one of our great humanist thinkers and, and leaders. Um, Jason, tell, it, it must be so surreal to see a movie about someone that you knew, you know, a friend. I know that that can often be kind of disorienting, but is there a sort of an essence of Tony Bourdain that came through in this movie that, you, that you'd like to lift up? 
Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, and, and I want to say that I encourage everybody to see the film. Um, I, I can't say that. Um, It's so intimate and and raw. Morgan had so much um, material to to see so many elements of his life, you know, behind the scenes, on camera, um, you know, the the struggles he had with uh, his image as uh, of being a famous person, um, and I, I want to say that I. Uh, I really enjoyed the film. I'm not sure I enjoyed the experience because there's so much heartbreak about it. Um, and I think that, that that'll come through for a lot of people. Um, but it's it's a really beautiful uh, investigation into into his life, into his um, essence and, and what he meant to, to so many people. And I, as I think some of, of the, the, the characters in the, in the film say, uh, I'm not so sure he understood how much he meant to so many. You know, Morgan. Thank you, Jason. Of course. One striking thing about this film is just how much of his life Tony Bourdain lived on camera. I mean, there's just this plethora of visual material that you had to work with. Is that a blessing or a curse? Um, it's a blessing. <laughs> You know, not that it can't, you can't uh, curse at it while you're in the middle of tens of thousands of hours of footage, but it's absolutely a blessing. And um, I mean, there were so many things. I mean, you can imagine the amount of footage and the amount of documentation of his life, self documentation, trying to squeeze that into a film, and the number of things that didn't fit in the film that were fantastic. Um, that was hard. But the, the thing, one of the things in the footage that I found really kind of amazing is that when he would sit down with somebody, somebody he hadn't met, at the very beginning of the meal, he would start to open up about himself in a very raw way. He would just start talking about, you know, how he missed his daughter or um, his own struggles with drug use um, in a way. And he would go on, I mean, for a while. And this was part of his technique to get people to open up. Of course, when they edited the shows, they always cut out all of that stuff. But going back and looking at the footage, there's a lot of confessional footage right on camera uh, in scene. And and I think it was part of why people responded to him. I mean, he was so, it's not like he was a perfect, you know, TV host. <laughs> he was he was he was perfect because of his imperfections, that he was um, full of doubt, full of, um, you know, sometimes self-loathing, you know, certainly ups and downs. Um, and I think that all came across, you know, just the fact that he was the first one to admit he didn't have answers. He was looking, looking to learn. And as he says in the film, you know, there's nothing he liked more than to go someplace and be completely surprised by what he found. And I think that's why people liked watching him do that, is that we don't actually get that experience that much uh, these days. Right. Um, I want to add one thing on top of that, if it's all right. I, I think that all of those things that Morgan just said um, are what made him such a good journalist. And I, I don't think, you know, I, I know that he, he didn't like to be called a journalist. I asked him specifically about it myself. Uh, but, you know, that that doubt, but also that, that you know, openness to uh, possibility and, and being wrong, uh, and that ability to kind of share himself to, you know, get the best of um, of what he could from from people who were, he was talking to. Those are all things that we as journalists should be uh, doing more of. Amen. Uh, I'd like to interject a uh, question from the audience, and this is from Kelly Mayer. I hope I have that right, or Maher in New Mexico. And Kelly wants to know, if Anthony Bourdain watched this documentary, what would he think about it? I might start with Jason for this one. I mean, I think that he would um, feel like there was a lot of representation of, of, of his, his life. Um, I think he'd have um, maybe a hard time hearing back from uh, those closest to him that are in the film, uh, the way that they, they felt about him. 
Uh, but ultimately, um, you know, I think he would say something effective. The show must go on. And this is, um, you know, this is what had to be done. Well, you know, there's a moment in the film early, early on when somebody says to him, you know, what are you doing tomorrow? And he says, oh, I'm doing Oprah. And he says, oh, I hate myself. And then he smiles. And I think that's very Tony, that he liked to say he didn't like the attention, but there was certainly part of him that was loving the attention. Um, and I, I think he would have had the same kind of mixed feelings. I mean, I've heard from people in his life who are in the film and others, family, you know, saying that he would have um, begrudgingly loved it. <laughs> you know, that, uh, and when I started making the film, in a way, in the beginning, he was my audience. Um, I really wanted to capture his DNA. So, you know, I went through every song he ever mentioned anywhere in raw footage and articles, um, you know, anywhere. And I put together a playlist that was 18 hours long of songs <laughs> that we all listened to. And those are all the songs that are in the film came from that playlist. Um, and watching movies and feeling like Tony would recognize the DNA of all that stuff. And I think he would have. But I came to a kind of a fork in the road pretty early on when I started to spend time with people in Tony's life. And I had a conversation with his uh, longtime agent. I guess I can tell the story. But um, she had said in the wake of his death pretty soon after that she had received a call from a, a suicide prevention society asking to use Tony's name for something. And she said no, because she knew Tony would have hated it. And a year later, they came back and asked again. And she started to say no. And then she paused and said, you know what? Tony doesn't get to say. And I think there was this fork in the road where Tony, there's part of the film that Tony shouldn't like, <laughs> you know, and that's the part of the, the crater he left behind by his suicide. And because I was a witness to that, getting to know to this day, you know, and become friends with people in his life and seeing how they're still rearranging their lives and their psyches to, to what happened. So in that way, the film changed for me. Uh, and I had to try and honor both at the same time. Yeah, you know, that you're... gets... That's all I wanted to say. I just, I think he accomplished that. Um, I do think that there's sort of a, a, a subtext that runs through the movie, which is, it, it, or maybe it's not a subtext, but it gets to this kind of myth that he was chasing. Um, you know, he wanted that rock and roll life. He wanted to be Keith Richards. He wanted to be Hunter Thompson and Ernest Hemingway. And, you know, that led to his early addiction problem, which he conquered. But then you can kind of see that same behavior playing out, albeit in much more productive and positive ways. But that that can also, but just buying into that myth and and needing to live it out, or or you know, not exactly knowing where to put it, I felt like that was also um, at play with him. And I just, I don't know. I, I'll open that again up to both of you to see if you think there's a reality there. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just start by saying, um, you know, when he got married and had a child, which he never expected to do in his life, that we have footage where he's talking and he says, uh, you know, I am I am not only am I not cool, I am no longer in the vicinity of cool. And he is kind of like suburban 50s dad, you know, barbecuing by the pool. And I think he really tried to do that for a while. But when that life for him failed he kind of reverted to this trajectory of the the rock and roll live fast die young kind of attitude which he romanticized um and there's a moment which to me is actually maybe the most poignant moment for me in the film which is when he meets iggy pop who is one of his biggest biggest heroes and he says to iggy what excites you today and iggy says to be loved and to feel the love of those around me. And God, if that wasn't the message Tony needed to be hearing at that time and to hear it from one of his heroes. And I don't think he entirely heard it. In fact, I know he didn't. Yeah. Um, 
at one point, one of your, and I can't remember, it's one of the Davids, <laughs> it's either David Chang or David Shows, says that, you know, at the beginning of the television career, yes, the shows were about food, but by Parts Unknown, it it became about Tony becoming a better person. Um, and I, and Jason, I wanted to ask you, like, when you met Anthony Bourdain, where do you feel like he was in his own evolution on that trajectory? Yeah, I mean, I think that that was certainly becoming clearer, right? You know, I had spent years and years watching um, No Reservations, and um, when we were, you know, waiting for him to arrive at this this restaurant in Tehran, I was very um, nervous, right? Um, but he was so uh, disarming and engaging and nice and inquisitive and thoughtful, well-read, all of these things. And I, I could see, you know, you, you don't become those things overnight. I mean, I think that's part of who he was. Uh, and I think in those later years, he, he kind of put those things together to do good for, for more and more people. Um, the day that he died, I'll, I'll never forget, I, I, I was taking an Uber somewhere and I was sitting in the back of the car and the driver could see that, that you know, something was wrong. And I said, you know, a friend of mine died and we, we got to talking and, you know, I just said who it was and driver was from, um, from Nigeria and he pulled over um, and he pulled out his cell phone and he, he had a picture of a quote from Tony and he started talking about how, you know, Bourdain had humanized people um, in Africa in a way that nobody else had. And that, you know, he went to Congo and, and made it seem like, you know, he enjoyed it the way he would enjoy Paris. And that just meant so much to him. And um, yeah, I think that 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 he was um, he was well on that trajectory by the time I met him. But, you know, those last couple of years, uh, he was operating at a different level in terms of giving voice to to voiceless communities. And and you also, uh, he gave you some really interesting advice when you were embarking on your own um, fame, I guess, for lack of a better word, you know, when you became kind of a well-known person. Tell us a little bit about, and, and this gets to his ambivalent relationship with television and, and celebrity. Yeah, I mean, so so when, when my wife and I returned to the U.S. in 2016, um, we had a lot of people asking us to do lots of different things, and I was in the process of trying to develop a book project. Um, and we had dinner with Tony in, in New York. And, you know, I was scheduled to do a couple of big morning television interviews. And he was really adamant, you know, you're, you're not going to do that. Don't go on television right now. If your experience is too raw. You don't have, a, you know, a book or anything to, to hawk. Um, and at the end of the day, all they're going to try and do is encapsulate your really tough experience into a couple of minutes. They're going to try and make you cry. You're not going to feel good about it. And that's going to be you to the world forever. And, you know, it sounds kind of harsh, but he was so clear and, um, and sort of um, sure of it that, you know, Yegi, my wife and I walked away from that dinner and we picked up the phone and called the PR people that we were working with said, we're not doing any TV right now. And it was literally the best piece of advice I've ever gotten professionally. Um, and I've done plenty of TV since, but um, but I'm not sure how my life would have played out if I'd gone on whatever show I was scheduled to do that day. Mm. Wow. Um, Morgan, that, that the last 20 minutes, 30 minutes of this film are, are just really devastating because that is when you address the end of, of Anthony Bourdain's life and the circumstances leading up to it. Um, and, and you do address his relationship with Asia Argento. Did She is not interviewed in the film. Did you reach out to her? I didn't. I didn't. You know, we talked at great length about it. And part of the complication of that last year of his life is um, is the relationship, but it's it was such a complicated relationship that the more you get into it, the more questions it begs. And it starts to, you know, even when we had more of it in the film, it, it starts to throw off the entire 
narrative balance of the movie. You know, that it's 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 such a Byzantine kind of story. And the details ultimately aren't illuminating to me as to what Tony was thinking. And and I felt like if I was to ask her to do it, um, it just would have made the film more about his death than about his life. And already that was uh, something I was struggling to balance. Um, so it was just a creative decision of mine. Um, Jason, I asked you earlier about what, what part of Tony Bourdain's essence you felt the film capture. What, what can't a film capture about him that you'd like to, to tell us about? I mean, I think you spoke to uh, him as a humanist. I think that the 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 empathy comes through, um, but the kindness and the camaraderie um, also comes through. But in in real life, it was just you know to another level, and and um, it's just really hard to capture that sort of intimacy on screen, especially when you're dealing with somebody with a subject that is so beloved by so many people. As Morgan said at the top, I mean, there are uh, so many people who feel that they know him through um, through his shows, and I certainly felt that way um, for for a long time. And then then I got to know him in real life, and it's that third dimension of um, you know personal exposure that you really can't put uh, to words to or, or or get on the screen. I just don't think that's possible, and I'm just really happy that I you know that I have that experience. I think. My wife and I had a really um, unique friendship with him um, that, you know, continues to just feed us. Well, and, and also um, behind the scenes, he was really dedicated to lifting up voices that hadn't been heard, right? Like some new and emerging writers that he was That's advocating right. for? Including me. I mean, you know, I think a lot of people don't know that he had... Uh, an imprint at Echo Books, and you know the many of the books that that he did were were cookbooks and and you know books by chefs, but there were other books like mine and uh, another that 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 was put out posthumously uh, by um, uh, an Indian American who became a, a a police detective. I mean, you know, stories that he felt wanted to be told, he was going to help get them told, uh, and he had the the influence, the resources, and the platforms to do that. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people who have that influence and those platforms that don't use them to amplify other people. And, um, and you know, I, I thank my lucky stars that, that, that Tony decided to amplify us. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time. Um, we'll have to leave things there. Morgan Neville, Jason Rezaian, I can't thank you enough for joining us today and talking about your friend and your protagonist, Anthony Bourdain. The film is called Roadrunner, a film about Anthony Bourdain. It will be in theaters July 16th. Thank you both for coming. Thank you, Anne. Thank Thanks, you, Morgan. Both. And to our audience, please come back and join Washington Post Live on Monday morning, bright and early, 9 a.m. We'll be having a conversation focused on the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. We have a number of interesting guests lined up for that, including General David Petraeus. You won't want to miss it. I'm Anne Hornaday. As always, thank you for watching. <laughs>